everyone rehabilitation sciences youtube channel welcomes you today uh, on this lecture proprioception in uh, new osteoarthritis it is a unique topic uh, very less often presented by presenter and we are privileged to have dr nadesh today uh, to talk about in this topic and uh, the basic idea of rehabilitation sciences youtube channel is to uh, share the science Uh, re related to rehabilitation sciences and rehabilitation um, field so here we are here with uh, another very interesting topic and uh, uh, dr nares uh, you would like to have your consent uh, for making your lecture live on youtube sir yeah sure okay thank you so much for your um, consent and moderator today uh, dr sagun agrawal uh, he will formally introduce the faculty today and start the session thank you dr ram uh, good evening everybody welcome to the rehabilitation science group today we are having with us dr naresh bhaskar raj he is a phd in exercise and sports sciences from university of science malaysia in 2017 and he did his bachelor's in physiotherapy and masters in physiotherapy from dr m g r medical university india he is the graduate in the 1998 and from 2008 he is in malaysia uh, presently he is heading head of the school and the senior lecturer at university of sultan jainal abidin malaysia we welcome you dr nadesh on the habitation science group thank you thank you so much okay uh good evening everyone uh, it's nice to get to meet you all through this uh, youtube channel so thanks to uh, the rehabilitation science group for inviting me to present on the topic which is of interest to me which is proprioception in knee osteoarthritis most of us uh, think of pain and other forms of disability uh, associated with osteoarthritis but we ignore uh proprioception which is also a very important part in any form of musculoskeletal disorder especially with related to joint okay so today uh, i'm going to talk uh, my talk my talk will be very uh, very very short and very concise based on uh, proprioception alone so in brief uh, i'll just give an introduction of what is proprioception uh, what are the mechanoreceptors we have in our body and what is osteoarthritis most of you have heard of osteoarthritis and what are the pathogenic factors which are associated with osteoarthritis and how do we grade osteoarthritis radiographically and also according to different criteria and how to assess proprioception and finally what are the exercises that we think can improve proprioception in uh, patients with knee osteoarthritis so this will be the contents of my Uh, presentation so as most of us in the rehabilitation uh, group we should know about the term proprioception so proprioception comes from the latin word which is proprius which means one whole and uh, individuals perception perception is a sense of relative position of the parts of the body and the strength of the force that is employed so so this is uh, what is a proprioception it comes with the latin word proprius and also section perception how what we feel is the position of the body and what is the force necessary to move so it is also an unconscious uh, perception of unconscious perception of movement so this proprioception was termed by sherington in the uh, in the year 19 or six he is the one who termed this uh, word proprioception or coined the term proprioception so actually by definition it is defined as perception of joint position and movement because of different information which is coming from the internal peripheral areas which is from the inside of the body especially like muscles tendons joint capsules ligament which control our postural equilibrium 
and also joint stability, which I am very much interested. That is segmental posture. You refer to as segmental posture because this segmental posture is the one which gives you the alignment, which gives you the proper postural equilibrium, which we all have. So if this joint stability is lost, normally we are supposed to lose the postural equilibrium and also a several conscious sensation, which is the muscle strength, how much we move, how much force is produced by the muscle. So this is the definition of proprioception. And this term proprioception was coined by Sherrington in the year 1906. Okay. So uh, again, there are a few more definitions based on uh, different uh, manuscripts or journals. Proprioception is a conscious capacity to sense position, movement, and force of the body segment, which I already uh, told you before. So it is not just only position of your joints, it also the movement, whether we are moving it, uh, bending or stretching, and what is the force with which we are moving. All these are termed as proprioception. Okay, so when we come talk about joint proprioception, what are the structures which are involved in joint proprioception? mainly the joint capsules. They have uh, joint receptors, which controls the posture. That is a segmental posture. And also we have receptors in the skin and musculoskeletal systems. And also the ligaments, which also have a lot of receptors, which gives the feedback to the spinal cord and to the brain to maintain or control the position or movement of the joint. So, in short, the capsules, ligaments, and muscles, they have many receptors, which gives a, the position sense to the person. Okay. So let's talk about the receptors. What are the receptors we have? Especially, I'm going to concentrate mainly on the uh, joint, joint receptors, which are present uh, in the joint capsules or ligaments. So we have different types of mechanoreceptors. The first one is the encapsulated nerve endings. Encapsulated nerve endings are one where the nerve endings are covered. They are not free, like what we have free nerve endings which transmits pain. These are nerve endings which have a cover or it is covered, the endings are covered. Okay, so what is the function of these encapsulated nerve endings? They monitor stretch in the organs of locomotion, especially the muscle stretch, the ligaments, these also give an input to how much it is stretched, how far it is stretched. Then there are main three types of proprioceptors in our uh, musculoskeletal system. The first one being the muscle spindles, which are present inside the muscle pulp. So what is the function of these muscle spindles? It is usually to measure the length of the muscle or changing length. So we talk about contraction, we talk about eccentric, we talk about concentric, we talk about static or isometric. So these changes in muscle length are uh, picked up by the muscle spindles, which are embedded in the uh, perimysium, which is between the muscle fascicles. The second one is called the GTO or the Golgi tendon organs, which are located near the musculotendinous junction or the tendon between uh, or the junction between the muscle and the tendon. So these are one of the mechanoreceptors or very important proprioceptors, which we are going to see. This monitored tension within the tendons. So whenever there is a pull or there's a translation of the bone, either anteriorly, laterally, medially or posteriorly, these are the uh, organs which sense and immediately give a feedback to the brain or create a reflex. So this is the next proprioceptor which are very important when we talk about uh, joint proprioception. The third one is the receptors or the sensory nerve endings which are present within the joint capsules. The joint capsules also have sensory nerve endings which also sense the position, how much the capsule is stretched, how much it is distended, how much it is compressed. So these three are the one which gives information about the position and the movement. Like when, when, we, when we talk about proprioception, it is usually two forms, which is one static position sense, which is the position of the joint. Whether now if I ask what is the position, you can say my knee is straight, my knee is bent. So, and 
the next is movement sense when you start moving you know which direction you are moving whether you are move, bending your elbow or stretching your elbow bending your knee even without seeing we can still know what is the position what is the movement happening so this are the two when we talk about proprioception it is usually joint position sense or joint movement sense which we talk about so these are the mechanoreceptors which are present in the musculoskeletal system especially around the joint so these are the ones which are very important when we talk about joint proprioception so muscle spindles gtos and joint kinesthetic receptors which are nothing but the sensory nerve endings within the joint capsules okay so uh, this is the one which i was talking to you now so this is the picture of a muscle spindle which most of us should know which we have studied in physiology so this is the muscle spindle which responds to the changes in the uh, think length so and then this is your gto golgi tendon organ which is present in the tendon musculotendinous junction where it is going to uh, respond to the stretch how much the bone is pulled so based on that this is going to fire so when it fires you are going to have the feedback of how much it is uh, you are going to have the postural or segmental posture or postural stability all right so when we talk about types of proprioception actually there are two types of proprioception one is the conscious proprioception and the subconscious proprioception which is the conscious level reach it reaches the level of cerebral cortex uh, sensory area via the dorsal column which is your posterior column and the subconscious which goes up to the cerebellum through cere spinal cerebellar tract so usually you can have a conscious proprioception and subconscious proprioception so uh, coming back to what are the structures concerned with proprioception just in a nutshell so there are many structures which are concerned with proprioception starting from our brain stem where you have all the descending tracts cortico spinal olivo spinal rubro spinal vestibulo tecto reticulo all these also involved in proprioception then we have the vestibular system which is coming from your inner ear through the vestibulo cochlear nerve so which controls your alignment of your head then we have the visual system giving you the visual feedback then you have the cerebellum which especially the floccular nodular lobe or the uvula which gives you the static or dynamic uh, proprioception movement of uh, static position sense then you have the proprioceptors which are present in the joint muscle and most of the structures in the body then we have the parietal lobe which is your cerebral cortex and then you have the ascending tracts which is your posterior column mainly with the proprioception ascending tracts so these are in short in nutshell about the structures which are uh, concerned with proprioception and we are going to mainly concentrate on proprioceptors how to train the proprioceptors in case of osteoarthritis of knee okay so this is uh, in short a brief uh, introduction about proprioception what is proprioception what are the structures involved in proprioception and what are the receptors we have in the joint like i told you muscle spindle golgi tendon organs and also the uh, joint kinesthetic receptors then going into the next important part of the presentation which is about the osteoarthritis of knee most of us know about the knee joint which is the uh, main weight bearing uh, joint in the human body so it most of us know the structure it has got its cartilage meniscus and ligaments throughout the joint right so we have the anterior cruciate ligaments anterior cruciate posterior cruciate we have the lateral meniscus we have the collateral ligaments on the side so we have more ligaments here which means you have more uh, receptors in the knee joint but what happens when there is uh, arthritis that's what we are going to see later so these are all the ligaments and the structure of the knee joint when we look at a normal point of view right 
So coming to osteoarthritis, so knee, uh, I'm not going to the anatomy or physiology of the knee joint, what are the movements, uh, how much. So I'm just going about uh, directly into the knee osteoarthritis. So as we know, arthritis is degeneration or inflammation of the uh, articular cartilage. It is a common disorder of knee causing arthritis uh, or it is a very common disorder of knee. And there are many types of arthritis and osteoarthritis is a very, very common disorder of the knee. And there are many studies which they have done on osteoarthritis of knee, mainly on pain. So it affects almost 15% of the human population globally and the percentage has been increasing because we are having more uh, aging population. So incidence is doubled by the year 2020 due to the increase in elderly and 2050, there are going to be uh, too many elderly people in the world and also number of obese individuals are going to increase. So the incidence of knee osteoarthritis is supposed to increase drastically, right? So this is what many studies say, even the WHO has predicted that there is going to be an increase in the case of uh, osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis. So knee osteoarthritis is twice as common as hand or hip osteoarthritis. And compared to hand and hip, this is very, very common because it's a weight-bearing uh, knee, weight-bearing joint, okay. So uh, when we talk about the onset, the onset is usually in the sixth decade or when we talk about uh, decade years, it is about 60 years, but we have osteoarthritis starting from age 40 or even less than that, we have incidence. But when you compare the volume, it is usually uh, supposed to be after 60 years, but we have cases less than 50 or even 50 to 60 in the fifth decade also we have many cases of osteoarthritis or even in the third decade or fourth decade, we can still see uh, cases of osteoarthritis coming up. So uh, once the year goes on, I think this uh, eight, 60 years is going to reduce to 50, 40, and we are going to see many people at a, with osteoarthritis at a very young age, right? So uh, symptoms of knee osteoarthritis increases with increased loading of joints during walking. So whenever there is an increased loading of joints, so there is going to be an increase in the symptom of knee osteoarthritis. Most of us know what are the symptoms of knee osteoarthritis. It is usually going to be a pain, stiffness, or swelling, decrease in range of motion. So all these early morning stiffness, cannot do their daily activities like climbing up the stairs, squatting, sitting in the toilet. So all these are going to be greatly affected uh, whenever the disease is going to progress, especially with increased loading of joints during walking. Once the loading is more and more, the symptoms of osteoarthritis is going to increase, right? So this is an animal study which they have found out that the cartilage cell dies or death occurs at six hours of continuous repetitive loading and three hours of static loading. So if you load a cartilage continuously or repetitively for six hours, you can see the cartilage cell is dying. And if there is a three hours of static loading on the uh, cartilage cell, which is a chondrocyte, the chondrocyte dies. So this is a study which is done on uh, animals, not yet on human beings. So we are not aware of how much, how long does the human cartilage or chondrocyte can withstand load. But in animal studies, they have found out that six hours of continuous or repetitive loading and three hours of static loading can cause the death of chondrocyte, especially in the joints, weight-bearing joints. So cell death was directly inclined with mechanical loading of the Cartilage, which means the more you load the cartilage, the more there was cell death in the uh, in the cartilage. All right. So when we talk about uh, who is more susceptible for osteoarthritis, whether it is a males or females, it has been found out in many many studies, uh, even recent ones, that elderly females were more susceptible for osteoarthritis of knee or any form of osteoarthritis, it was usually the elderly females who were more, more and more susceptible. 
So what are the pathogenic factors in osteoarthritis? What, what happens? What is the pathology uh, taking place in osteoarthritis? It can be any, any osteoarthritis. I'm just referring this to osteoarthritis of knee. So uh, mainly there can be two reasons for osteoarthritis, two pathological factors. One, there is an abnormal stress or number two, there is an abnormal cartilage. So either there is an abnormal stress on the cartilage or the cartilage is already abnormal. So abnormal stress comes from either obesity and the patient is obese or overweight. So there is an abnormal stress on the cartilage, which means too much of loading, mechanical loading on the cartilage or anatomical abnormalities where the tibia is deformed, the femur is deformed, the, uh, the structure of the femoral condyle is not well developed. So that can also cause an abnormal stress on the cartilage. Microfractures, bone remodeling, and also can cause, if there is already a fracture uh, and there is a remodeling, that can also cause abnormal stress. Loss of joint stability due to any trauma to the ligaments, either due to an injury or an accident or uh, any in a game. So, or trauma, a trauma where there is a damage to the joint, there is swelling of the joint. Because of that, there is too much of abnormal stress on the cartilage. Then there is an abnormal cartilage. The cartilage is not normal. Can be due to aging. So this can be due to aging. Once we start to age, the cartilage starts to break. If there is a lot of fibrillation or cracking in the cartilage, so it is an abnormal cartilage. Number second one, genetic and metabolic disease. Any problem with the genes. So now nowadays they link osteoarthritis uh, to genes, to a gene which is already deformed or gene there is uh, not proper structure of the gene. They link, uh, they found out that there is a genetic fix susceptibility to osteoarthritis. Then inflammation, it can be any form of arthritis which affects and changes the cartilage into an abnormal structure. Or as we know, uh, immune system activity, even sometimes the immune system overacts and it can uh, damage the cartilage. So there are two main pathological factors. One is the abnormal stress, which is coming out due to all these reasons. The second one is the abnormal cartilage, which is due to all these. So whenever there are these two commonly reasons, there is a compromised cartilage. The cartilage is compromised. So there is a biophysical changes, which is the collagen network fracture, proteoglycan, the protein unraveling, and also there is biochemical changes in the cartilage. The inhibitors are reduced, the proteolytic enzymes are increased. So leading to a complete breakdown of the cartilage just exposing the bony surface and starting to give a lot of pain to the patient. And also all the other symptoms associated with arthritis. So in short, these are the pathology of uh, osteoarthritis. One, there is an abnormal stress and two, there is an abnormal cartilage. So abnormal stress relates because of all these uh, possible causes and abnormal cartilage due to all these causes. So because of these two, the cartilage is compromise and because of this compromise in cartilage there are biophysical physical changes in the cartilage and also biochemical changes in the cartilage leading to cartilage breakdown so once the cartilage is broken down the periosteum is exposed and the bones are going to rub against each other causing all the deformities or pain whatever you call it so why osteoarthritis? As I told you in the previous slide, osteoarthritis are, is very common in females uh, compared to males. So there are, when we research, find out why is it, there are a few reasons, few reasons why females get osteoarthritis very common than uh, males. One is they have a greater genetic susceptibility to get osteoarthritis. So there is uh, some form of genetic susceptibility in females by because of which there's uh, early cartilage breakdown in females. Then females are cons uh, uh, considered to have weak quadriceps muscles compared to males. So this is based on studies. They have found out that the female quadriceps muscles are 
weak compared to males. The next one is last, uh, less cartilage volume. When they measure the volume of the cartilage in males and females, they have found out that the female's cartilage volume, the articular cartilage volume is less compared to males. So whenever there is a less cartilage volume, the shock absorbing capacity is reduced. And when, apart from that, there is obesity, abnormal stress, the cartilage breaks down very easily and uh, exposing them to have osteoarthritis at a very young age as well. The last one is low uh, loss of cartilage due to low levels of insulin-like growth factor. So whenever there's a low levels of IGF-1, this can cause uh, loss of cartilage from the joint leading to uh, uh, more osteoarthritis in females. So these are, apart from other reasons, these are the uh, common reasons uh, which were found to be associated with uh, osteoarthritis in females. Weak quadriceps muscle, less cartilage volume, loss of cartilage due to low levels of insulin-like growth factor and greater genetic susceptibility. So these are, uh, there may be other causes, but see, these are the most important causes uh, which I felt I need to share. So. The next, coming to how do we diagnose uh, osteoarthritis of knee? Can we just uh, diagnose every person who is coming with knee joint pain as osteoarthritis? So there is a, a, a American College of Rheumatology revised criteria for early diagnosis of knee OA. So usually the ACR criteria is the one which is very commonly used if uh, in diagnosis of knee osteoarthritis. So uh, there is three criteria or one, there is an entry criteria, there is domain one and domain two. So entry criteria is knee pain and or knee bony tenderness. A patient who comes with a knee pain or when you uh, palpate, there is a bony tenderness or absence of exclusion criteria. A exclusion criteria is the one where the knee is very hot. If the knee is very hot, there is synovitis, and uh, there is internal derangement of knee. When you see there are, you see signs of internal derangement of knee, there is meniscal injury or some, then you, these are exclusion criteria to exclude them as knee OA. So the main entry criteria is patient should have a knee pain or knee bony tenderness. Then the patient should not, the joint should not be very hot. The joint should not have any signs of synovitis and the there should not be any internal derangement of knee. This is according to American College of Rheumatology. So domain one, mechanical knee pain, which is the knee pain increases when there is loading, especially while squatting or while climbing the steps or while doing some activities and standing, they feel there is a pain is increasing. Knee bony tenderness, when, which when you palpate the bone, there is a tenderness, there is pain on touch or pain on pressure. And you hear some grating sounds of crepitus on knee motion. And also the synovial fluid has got changes inside. This is domain one. Domain two is age less than 40 years or 50 years old at onset. Age at onset more than 50 years. So either around 40 or more than 50. Knee bony enlargement and osteophyte in knee x-ray. So this is domain two. So what they see is whenever you want to diagnose a, place, a person to have knee osteoarthritis, the patient should have the entry criteria, these two, plus any one in domain two. So they should have three criteria out of these 10. Of these 10, there should be three, and especially one from the domain so this is the revised criteria for diagnosis of knee osteoarthritis. So previously there was another criteria where age more than 50 years. And normally uh, nowadays researchers or doctors use clinical as well as radiological diagnosis. It is just not based on clinical confirmation. They also go and do the x-ray to radiologically check whether the patient is having knee OA. So it has to be combined. When you want to pay, diagnose a patient as having knee OA, it should be a clinical plus a radiological diagnosis. It is not just only either based on radiology or on uh, 
clinical. It should be combined. It should be a combination of clinical as well as radiological factors. So. Uh, if you want to clinically, this is the criteria which is very commonly used in most of the studies and most of the doctors, they use American College of uh, Rheumatology criteria, even though there are many other criteria, this is commonly used in most of the researches done. Okay. And there is a revised one, uh, which is three out of 10 and one from domain two. Okay, so the next one is how do they grade uh, osteoarthritis of knee based on uh, x-ray or radiography? So again, the very, very common uh, grading scale which is used by orthopedic surgeons is the KL grading scale or the kelgren lorentz grading scale. Very commonly, if you read any articles on osteoarthritis, mostly they mention about KL uh, grading of x-ray. So actually there are five grades. So grade zero is a normal uh, is a normal joint there where there is no joint space narrowing, there is no osteophytes, everything looks very normal. They call it grade zero, but the patient has got knee pain. So they do take an X-ray, but there is no changes. They call it grade zero. Grade one is one where there is a doubtful. Doubtful means there is a minute osteophyte or a doubtful significance. The ice, you can see a very, very small osteophytes are very less uh, joint space narrowing. It It is not normal. There is some changes, but the changes are very, very uh, mild. So they classify it as grade one. Uh, the next one, grade two is the mild uh, mild category, which is there is a definite osteophytes like at the edges of the bone, you can see an extra growth or osteophytosis. And uh, still the joint space appears to be normal. So this is considered to be grade two. Grade three, there is, we call it moderate, a moderate joint space reduction. The joint space appears to be reduced and also there will be osteophytes on the sides. And grade four, the joint space is very severely greatly reduced and there is subchondral sclerosis. You can see the white shadows under the bone due to loading. There is sclerosis of the uh, subchondral bone, the bone beneath the cartilage. So this is how they grade uh, osteoarthritis of knee based on uh, radiological features or the X-ray. So there are five grades. Grade zero is normal, grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four. Usually grade four are uh, mostly, uh, uh, the treatment is mostly surgery, surgical replacement of the knee joint. So where we can intervene is grade one, grade two, grade three, where we have more chance of uh, correcting the proprioception or delaying the worsening of the uh, osteoarthritis of knee, right? Grade four, mostly they, it is uh, indicated for uh, replacement of the joint. There is another form of classification, which is also commonly used, which is called the ALBAC classification system. Again, uh, they go based on how much is the joint, these, are very old classification. The one which I mentioned previously, it's somewhere around 1950 or something, they started using that classification. And this one was in from the year 1968, they used this classification. So grade one, there's a joint space narrowing, but it is less than three mm. Then grade two, there is definite joint space obliteration. And grade three, there is minor bone loss. The bone is getting eaten up or grade four, it gets increased, so grade five. These are the classification, two classifications available for grading. And mostly the very commonly used one is the, uh, the one which I told you before, which is the kelgren lorentz grading scale, right? So, but you have another one, which is the al Bach classification system, right? So when we talk about uh, knee, there are, as I told you before, there are many ligaments in the knee joint. Of all these ligaments, which ligament is very, very important in regard to proprioception? So usually it is the anterior cruciate ligament. The anterior cruciate ligament contains mechanoreceptors. There are many mechanoreceptors, more mechanoreceptors at the attachment of the bone. Wherever the ACL gets attached to the bone, there you, have, you can see a lot of receptors. So this ACL can detect tension changes in tension, speed, acceleration, direction of movement, and position of the knee joint. That's why whenever there is an ACL injury, 
proprioceptive training is very very important and if there is a acl reconstruction proprioceptive training becomes very important because if there is no proprioceptive training the joint can become very very unstable right even the athlete will not be able to sense his uh, joint you can see the athlete complaining that he cannot feel the joint stable or something even though there is a reconstruction done okay so when the first histological demonstration of mechanoreceptors was done by schulz in the year 1984 they found out that human acl has mechanoreceptors and it was in the year 1984 so just for an information so <clears throat> uh, when we talk about what happens how does the proprioceptive loss occurs it is usually due to the lateral cartilage lesions increase laxity so whenever the joint space gets narrow when the joint spacing is get not automatically the ligaments which are supposed to be taut or tight just buckles it starts to bend and once there is laxity the proprioceptive capacity of the ligament is lost and also as i told you when you have older age uh, there are other factors which i'll tell you in the next uh, slides why there are loss of proprioception what are the factors to have loss of proprioception okay so when we talk about uh, proprioceptive loss in patients with knee osteoarthritis what are the very common reasons for knee osteoarthritis patients to have loss of proprioception is one laxity of ligaments the ligaments become lax why does the ligament become lax because the joint space the normal existing joint space goes in for narrowing so once there is a narrowing the structures which are on the side tend to become tend to loosen up so when there is loosening of the ligaments it will not be able to uh, sense the stretch which is coming to the ligament so automatically the joint is not able to sense what is the uh, movement position it's it is uh, in and are undergoing what position or movement it is undergoing okay the next one is disuse atrophy like once we have knee osteoarthritis we they have pain because of pain they don't use the muscle when they don't use the muscle the muscle becomes thin and this when the muscle becomes thin again the muscle spindle is not getting fired and the gto which is in the tendon uh, they are not getting fired so they just going for a going to a sleep mode so because of that again the proprioceptive capacity is lost number 3 abnormal loading of the joint so once the once the knee cartilage is uh, damaged the loading of the joints are not equal it starts to shift because the patient changes the style of walking or the un, uh, unknowingly we try to modify our body position or the joint position so we try to externally rotate internally so we are abnormally loading the joints which is also one of the reason for why uh, there is loss of proprioception and loss of mechanoreceptors once we start aging and once we are not giving enough stimulus the mechanoreceptors in the ligaments and capsules they are going to be uh, there will be loss of mechanoreceptors from the ligaments and also from the capsules from the cartilage so these are another reason why there is loss of proprioception and the next one is decrease in the size of neural components neural components what we are talking about is the size of the nerve fibers the neuromuscular junctions all these the size of the nerve fibers or the sensory nerves they also decrease in size whenever there is aging and because of usually arth arthritis occurs at elderly uh, individuals so once the patient starts to age the size of the nerve components the neural components all gets decreased like the axons all these myelination everything becomes thinner and thinner so the uh, impulse is not getting trans, uh, communicated to the higher centers so these are the most common cause for loss of proprioception in knee osteoarthritis so whenever we talk about uh, osteoarthritis of knee why there is loss of proprioception proprioception it is a combination of cumulative factors one is which is the laxity of ligaments which you can see in the knee joint there is disuse atrophy of the muscle there is abnormal loading of the joints there is loss of uh, mechanoreceptors from the ligaments 
and there is a decrease in the size of neural components like the nerve fibers they reduce in size the thickness of the nerves also reduce so there is less firing from the uh, less transmission of impulse so these are the common uh, causes for loss of proprioception mainly uh, in knee osteoarthritis okay so uh, muscle strength proprioception and joint loading are very very interrelated so which means muscle strength and proprioception they are very directly proportional increase in muscle strength there is more proprioception and proprioception and joint loading are inversely related so which means if the joint loading uh, is going to be more the proprioception is going to become less and if the joint loading is going to reduce the proprioception can increase so if the cartilage is uh, damaged so participants with arthritic arthritic knee have poor proprioception compared to that of control there are a lot of studies uh, on many uh, knee joint especially especially with ligament injuries but arthritis very very few and of these few studies they have found out that uh, patients who have uh, knee osteoarthritis have very very poor proprioception so whenever there is poor proprioception in one knee automatically it is going to affect the other knee as well okay initiation or worsening of degeneration of the knee joint may be due to reduced proprioception they also think reduced proprioception can initiate or even worsen a degeneration of the knee joint if the joint is not able to sense itself properly then the loading is going to uh, become very very abnormal and this also can precipitate more degeneration of the cartilage right <clears throat> so impact proprioception leads to reduce knee uh, protection thereby causing degenerative damage to the knee joint again whenever there is a loss of proprioception the protection is lost so there is more going to be more uh, degenerative changes and there are studies which says both weight bearing and not weight bearing exercises are effective which i'll talk to you later after uh, showing you how to assess okay so normally if you see most studies most studies have uh, exercises which is done on uh, weight bearing like uh, standing on a wobble board or a balance board but the problem in osteoarthritis is we have to reduce the loading so we cannot do too many weight bearing activities to improve proprioception because the patient may refuse to come the other days because of increase in pain so we have to come out with some other alternative apart from doing this uh, weight bearing proprioceptive training okay so coming to how to assess proprioception in knee joint so this is in short about knee osteoarthritis and how uh, osteoarthritis affects proprioception or proprioception uh, increases the arthritic uh, damage to the knee so when we talk about assessing proprioception so there are many ways to assess proprioception but the normal common one we what we do is uh, threshold to detect passive movement number one number two is active repositioning error number three is passive repositioning error so threshold to detect passive movement active repositioning error which is otherwise called the active angle reproduction number three is passive repositioning error which is passive angle reproduction so this one we have done experiments uh, in malaysia and we have assessed the proprioception of patients with knee osteoarthritis we have done all the three assessments and i'll show you what is the results just to uh, give you the uh, importance of proprioception in knee osteoarthritis so in malaysia what we did is we had a isokinetic device so this is a biodex isokinetic device with which we assessed uh, the proprioception of the knee joint so this can be done with goniometers as well this can be done with uh, in weight bearing as well but the problem is you have to reduce as much as sensory cue to the patient so i have blurred the patient's face uh, because of privacy so if you we have already blindfolded the patient and we have given him uh, microphones where a plain sound is produced so that he doesn't get any visual feedback 
or any auditory feedback. So we have cut down the visual and auditory feedback. So if you can look at the pictures, we have given an add splint to the ankle joint so that there is no sensory cue from the skin going to the brain so that the patient will be able to use his cutaneous receptors to sense the joint position sense. And you can see we have taken off any form of clothing, especially over the knee, so that there is, again, no sensory cutaneous cue to the brain. So what we do is we move, we set the velocity at 0.5 uh, uh, degree per second, 0.5, very, very slow. So the machine will automatically move the knee joint from this position, it will start moving at a very, very slow pace, which is at 0.5 degree per second. So what we do is in the first, in the first one, which I mentioned just now, threshold to detect passive movement, we give the stop stopper to the patient. We ask the patient to click the button and stop as soon as he feels his leg is moving. So once the device starts to move the knee joint from this 90 degrees of flexion to zero degrees of extension at a very, very slow pace of 0.5. So we just tell the patient, once you sense that your knee joint is moving, you have to press the button and just stop the movement, right? So this is how we test threshold to detect passive movement. The second one is active repositioning error. Active repositioning error is we, uh, we actively ask the patient to move from 90 to 60 degrees, 90 to 45 degrees, 90 to 30 degrees. We show the patient first. So you have to move up to this level. You have to move up to 45 degrees. You have to move up to 30 degrees. We teach, we give some few three to five trials and then we ask the patient to move actively and stop. When he feels that he has reached 60 degrees, you have to stop. When you feel you have reached 45 degrees, you stop. When you, we randomly, because there is a learning effect in this process. So we randomly keep changing the uh, degrees so that the patient doesn't have learn or learns this process. So we randomly select the degrees and we actively ask the patient to actively extend. The previous one was passive. The movement, the machine is going to move and the patient has to stop. Here, the patient has to move and stop once he feels he has reached 60 degrees of knee flexion, just stop. He has reached 45 degrees, stop. Whatever he feels is the angle, which we have already familiarized two or three times. The next one is a passive repositioning error. Passive repositioning error is again, the machine is going to move, again, as I told you, 0.5 degree per second. The machine will keep on moving the leg up to zero degrees of extension. From 90 degrees to zero degree, it is going to move. So we tell once, we show them first, this is once you reach 60, once you feel the machine has reached this level, press the stop button and stop. Once you have reached 45, press. So we familiarize the patient on how to do this and we go and check how much he's able to sense the movement. So, and uh, once the machine starts moving, the machine will move passively. That's what is called passive repositioning error. The machine will move passively. And once the patient senses that, okay, this is the level I need, this is the level of 60 degrees, he has to press. And then again, we ask them to move to 45, if he thinks it is 45. So we check how much error they make in this process. So this is how we assess proprioception of knee. This is what we have done in our research previously. Okay, so these are the three techniques how we assess uh, proprioception of knee. One is threshold to detect passive movement. So once it starts moving, immediately the patient has to detect that it has start to move. At what degree does he, is he able to detect? We measure that. Second one is active repositioning error and third one is passive repositioning error. Okay, so when we look at, I'm just talking about the findings, what we get 
in the osteoarthritic population. So you can see uh, we had around 60 patients with grade two and grade three. We, uh, we, didn't, we excluded grade four because they were already very severe form of arthritis. We included the grade two and three uh, grade of osteoarthritis according to KL, Kelgren and Lawrence Gray. So once you see uh, normally many people, uh, this is active repositioning error at 60 degrees. We did at three degrees, 60, 45, and 30. We could see that most of the patients had a proprioceptive error of almost five to 10 degrees. And then there were patients who had 10 to 15 degrees. There were patients who were overshooting or undershooting the leg of up to 15 to 25 degrees. And also many patients with 25 to 30 degrees of either uh, more than what is required or less than what is required. Okay. So when we look at active repositioning error, this is actively at 45 degrees. Again, you can see the patients had a proprioceptive uh, deficit of almost 10 to 15 degrees. Uh, there was an error, which means they didn't reach 45. They were ever either going uh, 55 degrees and then they stopped or they were uh, below 45 degrees. So again, you can see there's a huge uh, proprioceptive errors from patients. Again, this is another data which shows about at 30 degrees. Again, you can see uh, there are a lot of errors which they make in active reason. So almost six degrees or seven degrees there, there is a proprioceptive error. So once from 30 degrees, you stop 45, 60, you can see more people doing error. So as far as we have observed, all the patients of osteoarthritic knee, uh, they had uh, proprioceptive loss in the knee joint. Okay, this is talking about passive repositioning error. Again, you can see there are uh, many patients had almost seven degrees, seven to 15 degrees, 15 to 20 degrees of error when they were move passively. So this is the finding at 45 degrees, again, zero to six, six to 12 or 15 degrees, 18. So which means uh, according to studies, they have said that if it is less than five, it is, they are considered to be normal. Any joints where there's a proprioceptive loss of zero to five degrees, five degrees, if more than five degrees, it is time for us to intervene because the proprioceptive loss will increase gradually. So once you observe there is more than five degrees of proprioceptive error, so it is time for us to uh, start implementing uh, proprioceptive programs, even though the patient is have osteoarthritic, even though we think that there is no proprioceptive problem, but still uh, we have to start implementing proprioceptive programs. Okay. So this is again passive repositioning error at 30 degrees. Again, you can see there is a huge uh, proprioceptive error of zero to seven or seven to 15 degrees at 30 degrees. So when we talk about threshold to detect passive movement, you can see most of them were able to detect passive movement only after five degrees or after 10 degrees or even after 15 degrees of movement, then uh, they were able to sense. I'm not talking about normal, this is about patients with osteoarthritis of knee, especially grade two and grade three, uh, kellgren lorenz criteria. So this is the findings of our research, which we did on uh, knee osteoarthritis. And to be uh, almost all 60 people who were recruited, they had proprioceptive loss, varying proprioceptive loss. Uh, there were many causes. I'm not going into the causes. Why? Because it will take another However, when we talk about what are the factors, why it is, why they had more. So in short, I have already given what are the factors, cumulated factors previously, like laxity of ligaments, subnormal loading. So these were the reasons for uh, their to have proprioceptive loss. Okay. So we also tried uh, exercises and what we have found out and as exercises that can improve proprioception uh, I would like to share uh, with all the viewers. So we uh, we did a lot of exercise. We used isokinetic training as well. We used biofeedback. So I'm uh, giving you all the exercises which most of you, whenever you are uh, involved in treating a patient with osteoarthritis, you can start using this. 
So we implemented a strengthening exercise. We implemented a stretching exercise. We also implemented a range of motion uh, exercise. So strengthening, usually we did static quadriceps sitting in knee extension. We did standing terminal knee extension, seated leg press, partial squats with less weight, uh, like you support with the arm and step up. We included stretching exercise, which is standing calf stretch, supine hamstring stretch and prone quadriceps. And we also included knee range of motion exercise, which is uh, knee in mid flexion to full extension from mid flexion to full flexion and also a stationary cycling. So these are some of the pictures. This is your static quadriceps, this is your terminal knee extension, seated leg press squat, uh, squats, step ups, and this is your calf stretch, hamstring stretch, quad stretch. You can modify depending on the patient. This is just a model which we have used. So knee flexion to full flexion, knee flexion to extension, knee flexion to full flexion, and also uh, a stationary cycling. Stationary cycling, as I told you, uh, it gives you a velocity. So whenever you do a velocity at a specific velocity, it will help to uh, improve the sense, sensation of muscle spindle and also uh, the tendon organs, which I'll discuss later. Okay, we also implemented isokinetic training. If you are uh, having isokinetic device, you can try isokinetic device as well, where you can give five, five reps of concentric and eccentric contraction for knee extensors, five eccentric and concentric, which you can set in the machine for knee flexors at various speeds of 90 degrees per second and 150 degrees per second at a very less peak top, which is a uh, very less force because we don't want to uh, load the joint too much. That's why we are going for a very less peak top, right? So prior to this, we do a warm up and we also do a stretching to just to warm up the muscle and the joint. So this is a one exercise which also we found to increase proprioception of the knee joint because it is based on velocity. Uh, so velocity also fires few receptors, which I'll talk to you in the coming slides, All right? The next, we also did the uh, biofeedback. Uh, EMG, using EMG, we fixed electrodes and the vastus lateralis and vastus medialis. We gave a visual and auditory feedback to the uh, patients. So we used quadriceps isometric, hip adduction. We did SLR in supine, prone, side lying. And also we did 45 degree knee extension. All these we started to uh, use EMG for visual and auditory cue. So the main reason why we did we choose these because we don't want to load the joint too much. So we didn't go for any weight bearing. So if you see most of our uh, exercises are either very moderate weight bearing or very less weight bearing. And uh, we wanted to find non-weight bearing exercise, which can also improve proprioception without damaging the knee joints and uh, or prevent further, because we cannot change whatever happened in the knee joint. At least we can preserve whatever is there without loading. Same way, we, uh, at the same time, we want to strengthen the muscles. We want to uh, increase the sensitivity of the mechanoreceptor. So that's the reason why we, implemented these regimes, which were uh, mostly non-weight bearing in nature. Okay. So, uh, so what happens when we do these exercises is there is increased firing of motor neurons because most of them are either strengthening or stretching or velocity based. There is increased firing of motor neurons, which means there is uh, more recruitment of motor neurons and increase in muscle strength. And since we are using, uh, as I told you, velocity, like even a stationary bicycle is a very good exercise to increase proprioception because it depends on the velocity. So whenever there is a velocity dependent, it is going to stretch the GTO and the GTO starts to fire because uh, whenever there's an arthritis, these receptors go into a sleep mode. So we need to wake them up and we have to give various velocities to help them uh, start firing again. And there is a neuromuscular adaptation. There's a change in the nerve and muscle structure once the patients start to exercise all this, right? And also there is recruitment of fibers and more synchronous activation of motor units, especially when you 
give an EMG biofeedback. The patient is able to visualize what he does. It's even uh, doing a static quadriceps with a feedback and without a feedback, there's a lot of difference. And when you do it with a feedback, the patient is able to fire more motor units and you can see the graph immediately changing in the EMG. So there is also increment in the cross-sectional area of the muscle. The muscle size is also increasing even though we have not measured. There are studies which says that muscle uh, circumference also increase. There is going to be increase in range of motion automatically. And also there is an isovelocity. Isovelocity is when you fix the velocity at a, like as I told you 90 degrees or 150 degrees, it is just going to uh, do at the same velocity. So. There's a isovelocity contraction and also an isometric contraction of the muscle. So which is also helping in to fire the uh, mechanical uh, mechanoreceptors, which I already talked about in the joint. Okay. So what are the other benefits of exercise? Exercise improves the movement of sinovial fluid that lubricates the cartilage effectively. And also the muscle spindle and GTO are stimulated. As I told you, once the ligaments are uh, damaged, ligaments are lax, we cannot make the ligaments again tight. So we have to find an alternative way. We have to start using the other receptors more so that there is a compensation for the uh, receptors which are not working in the ligament. So we have to make use of the muscle spindles and GTOs which are present and also the capsule. So we try, we try to use these uh, other mechanical mechanoreceptors to improve the proprioception of the knee joint. So because we are not changing the structure, we cannot do anything with the structure of the knee. At least we should take make use of the other structures which are available to improve proprioception. Right. So the third point, uh, what, how it is beneficial is improved sensitivity of the mechanoreceptor present in the ligament due to eccentric and concentric contraction. So whenever uh, we all know about eccentric, which is a stretch, a lengthening contraction, a concentric shortening. So whenever there is a change, when you do an eccentric and concentric, so whenever you are uh, seeing a patient, you can implement both concentric as well as eccentric because this will uh, start to uh, increase the sensitivity of the receptors in the ligament. Okay, so this is one reason why you can have an improvement in the proprioception whenever you do uh, exercises, especially eccentric and concentric. Instead of just concentrating on concentric, we also have to implement eccentric or use both so that there is more uh, sensitivity of the mechanical symptoms. Right, so coming to the end uh, of my presentation. So just to summarize whatever I talked about, Proprioception is as important as any other sensation in our body, so we, we should not ignore proprioception. And number two is proprioception is affected in uh, knee osteoarthritis through, there are many studies to say, and even uh, the study which we did in Malaysia also tells the same, that knee osteoarthritis, there is a lot of loss of proprioception. So we can also include proprioceptive assessment. Whenever we assess a knee OA, uh, try to make a simple attempt to measure proprioception to know what is the status of proprioception. And definitely proprioception, uh, proprioceptive training improves proprioception, whether it is weight bearing or not weight bearing. If it is a knee osteoarthritis, I would like to suggest to go for non weight bearing more. If the patient doesn't have pain, you can go for weight bearing, but try to reduce the weight bearing because we don't want to load the cartilage too much. And uh, as I told you, it is not necessary to have proprioceptive training in weight bearing only, which is the concept we all know. Proprioceptive training should be done in weight bearing, but no, you can always think of non weight bearing proprioceptive trainings. There are many ways uh, of doing it. Even though you don't have EMG biofeedback, uh, isocantic device, still you can train proprioception. Uh, there are many innovative ways of training proprioception. There are now a lot of games, gamifications coming up where you can use it to train proprioception, right? So uh, I'd like to acknowledge a few people through because they are the one who has shared the knowledge, whatever I have sharing with you, especially my lecturers from JK College of Physiotherapy Panto, lecturers from Savita and also my supervisor and co-supervisor from University Science College. 
So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, patiently listening to my talk. Hope uh, there is some message from my uh, presentation and hopefully you can use it in your practice or while teaching. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Naresh. Uh, it was it was an excellent presentation on the role of proprioception and knee osteoarthritis, and uh, specifically the importance of proprioceptors in functioning of the joint. Uh, there were there were a few questions that uh, people wanted to know that in any way, despite the presence of uh, genetic factors or uh, modifiable factors, lifestyle factors, uh, can we stop the progress of osteoarthritis? Uh, it's quite difficult to stop the progress, but always we can delay the progress of uh, arthritis. And also we can reduce the symptoms. It's uh, very difficult to stop the progress. It will progress, but the rate at which it progresses can be definitely changed with our uh, proper planning, proper protocol. And also uh, it involves a lot from the patient because we need to advise the patient. If the patient doesn't follow, then uh, very difficult. Even if you're a surgeon, it's uh, no use, whatever we do. So with the patient's cooperation, definitely, yes, you can slow down the rate of progression, you can slow down the symptoms, you can reduce the worsening of the joints, but it's quite difficult to stop the progression. Uh, that's what uh, we have seen and that's what most of the studies say. Right, and uh, a lot of times what we have seen is that uh, uh, you mentioned that because of proprioceptive losses, uh, there is a possibility that people develop osteoarthritis. And yeah. at a later stage, uh, people go for knee replacement surgeries. Yes. And where, where you reject the ligaments, the capsule, and even certainly some muscles and the fascia, right. Right. Uh, uh, creating more damage to the proprioceptors. Yeah. So is it the right way to manage if proprioceptors are so important? Uh, actually, uh, even in replacement, when they do total re replacement, they try to retain the anterior cruciate ligament. If you look at the studies, there are ACL retaining replacements, uh, non-ACL retaining replacements, and uh, studies where the ACL has been retained whenever they do the replacement surgeries, they have more, the patient has got more perception of the joint rather than the joint which is replaced without the ACL. Right. So again, even though there is, they cut the capsules, there is definitely loss, but still we can bring up, we can increase the sensitivity of whatever is available. Uh, only thing is they do replacement mainly to reduce the pain. They are, uh, they are, even though they replace, still the knee joint is not stable. You can see if it is a mechanical one, there is loss of instability, there is a lot of instability in the joint. But if we train, if the ligaments are spared, which most of the orthopedics also, they try to uh, save few ligaments, mainly for this reasons to improve the proprioception. Otherwise, yes. still, even though they replace, only the pain factor is reduced, but the other factors of instability, still they need walkers, still they need a stick to walk because they feel it's quite uh, not stable. Yes. And I think this was my next question that I was uh, planning to ask you that the use of sticks and uh, uh, orthoses or uh, sole modification and sometimes also unloader uh, knee braces are there. Yes, yes, so as, yes. you, as you mentioned that the loading at the knee joint uh, is one of the reasons for cartilage damage. Yes. So is it true that these unloading devices can help? Uh, definitely it helps, but not in the long run. It is just to, uh, whenever there is very, very severe uh, pain or something, you want to unload, you want to reduce the damage to the cartilage, you can, you can go in for uh, these types of unloader brace or uh, wedge, wedges in the uh, insoles. All these do help to uh, reduce the load on the cartilage. As I told you, there are animal studies which says the more the cartilage is being loaded, 
the more the chondrocytes are dying, especially right. when repeated loading. So yes. uh, definitely these forms of braces definitely helps in reducing the load over the joint. And uh, most of the people are obese nowadays. So we have to rely upon extra, uh, what to say, extra appliances to reduce the load because it's, it's not an easy process to reduce weight over a couple of days or a couple of months and especially with old age people uh, they are not interested in reducing their weights less. so we have to definitely rely on these types of unloader uh, devices to reduce at least uh, because once you reduce a little bit of load uh, there is uh, too much of effect on the cartilage actually right thank you dr naresh for sharing this wonderful information today and we hope to have you again sometime. Sure. Uh, thank uh, you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Shahun for inviting me for this talk and all the people associated with this and all the viewers. So if there is anything, you can uh, email. Hope to meet you soon uh, with another topic of interest. Thank you very much. Thanks again.